I have an incredible show for you today. I have a, an incredible journalist to help me go through some absolutely wacky stories uh, that are in the news today. And uh, I have Emerald Robinson with me. Emerald, thank you so much for joining me today. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Stephen. So I, I want to just give some background to people that maybe are are new to you. Uh, you used to be the uh, former White House correspondent for Newsmax and OAN. Uh, you're an incredible journalist. You have a sub stack. You write about some of the, the biggest stories each and every day. What The first thing I wanted to discuss with you is President Joe Biden said today that he is convinced Donald Trump wants another January 6th. And the mainstream media seems happy to push this lie out on his behalf. Was there even ever any evidence that he colluded with these groups that ended up doing damage to the Capitol on January 6th? And if there was any evidence that would have exonerated him, wasn't that destroyed by Representative Liz Cheney? What, what are your thoughts on President Biden's comments today? Well, I think it's particularly concerning. I think it's very concerning in light of what is currently happening. And it doesn't get a lot of attention. So a lot of your audience, Stephen, might not be aware, but they are currently ramping up. They haven't slowed down. They're ramping up arrests related to January 6th. In fact, just on my way to talk to you, um, I had seen that there is a young female influencer who had touched a table. Now, I, I'll just say in disclosure, I don't know this person. I haven't spoke with her, though. I I do a lot of reporting on the January 6th um, defendants. Many of them are still political prisoners awaiting trial, right? How many years are we into this? And they're they're sitting just awaiting trial. Um, I haven't spoken with her, but she was indicted. Uh, it, it looks like two or three days ago on very minor uh, misdemeanors, but they even one of the indictments involves her touching a table that had moved through the crowd or something like that. Um, they also arrested, of course, a fellow journalist who I have great respect for because I, I've I, I've I've. Just, I, I've double checked his work as well. Um, that's Steve Baker, and he's with the Blaze. He they've been hanging this over his head for probably a couple years, possible indictments, and then he kept putting out information. He's one of the journalists that um, House Committee is actually working with to put out uh, more footage about January six. He was indicted just a couple weeks ago. Um, so I think with Biden saying that today, it just shows how they are committed to continuing the narrative that has already been debunked. It's already fallen apart, right, Stephen? There's been extensive reporting and we could go through a lot. Um, but yes, there was no collusion there, not on the part of Trump supporters, I would say. I think it gets more damning on the part of coordination and collusion if you look at um, the government agencies like the like particularly the Department of Homeland Security or FBI or the Capitol Police themselves. I think there's lots of questions you can ask related to conspiracy. And Steve Baker has done some excellent reporting on that. But when it comes to Trump supporters, no. Um, so I am very concerned when I hear I hear Joe Biden continue to talk about that today because it seems like something they're going to carry into the election. And it makes me wonder, what do they have up their sleeve? Because look, I was in the Capitol on January 6th. I was reporting for Newsmax. I was pulled off air when I heard some flashbangs outside. I now know they were flashbangs. I didn't know what they were, but I kept talking. Um, then, then the police, Capitol police, police come and pushed me over. I was put in the Cannon Rotunda basement, um, Cannon Hall basement for many hours that day. And some of these people that I see go out there and, and, and suggest that this was so horrible and these things that happened to them, they were sitting there with me, Stephen, worried that the Duck and Donuts didn't remain open in that part because we were in the commissary for that building. And they were wondering why the Duck and Donuts didn't stay open and they were upset. Um, so I think this just points to the fact that they have more in store even and that we should be worried about another possible false flag event. Oh, that's terrifying. Um, you, you mentioned it being okay. debunked. Uh, I've had... Uh, Jacob Chansley, the the mm -hmm. January 6th um, shaman. I've had Brandon Straka on. I've had a few mm -hmm. others. I was watching the uh, Steve Baker from The Blaze. Um, you know, they they kept saying, you know, it's just misdemeanors, but then they wanted to haul him in, make him take off his shoes. 
uh, put him in chains, you know, like really parade him around. My, my only worry is uh, those of us in independent journalism, we have debunked this, but I think that there's a lot of Democrats that still believe this is a day worse than 9-11, worse than Pearl Harbor. Uh, they need Joey Biden, big, big stick Joe Biden to, uh, you know, beat Trump down and, and uh, keep our country safe. Any any merit to that? Do you think Democrats still buy into January 6th? I think there are a lot of them that do. And that is the concern. Um, I think if you look at polling, the only real poll sort of that does any uh, gauging of public sentiment as it relates to, say, January 6th or election fraud as Rasmussen reports. And you'll see that many Democrats and many independents feel that the 20, 2020 election was uh, problematic, let's say, let's just use the word problematic. They don't trust that the results were accurate. They don't trust that Joe Biden is a legitimately elected president. And that, that goes across the board, independents and Democrats. I mean, the percentage is pretty high and, and surprising to me. Um, but when I look at the cross tabs and the questions asked, I I, I think that's probably accurate. Um, they also, there is now when you question the the possible federal involvement in January 6th, there's also a pretty high public sentiment that feels that there was some kind of federal involvement, that there was potential federal provocateurs, there was coordination on that level. Um, but there are those people that watch CBS, watch NBC, and I even have them in my own family, even though... They're in my family and I try to share with them the reporting that I have. Um, you know, I think when you hear sometimes from someone close to you, you, you what was it Jesus says, a prophet has no honor in their own land or, um, but um, there are a lot of those who feel that there were these people who tried to overtake the Capitol and enact a coup in order to keep Joe Biden from taking office. But I, I don't think that's such a high percentage, and but I could be wrong. I'm not saying that I have such a strong handle on them, this, but I don't think it's a very high percentage, but I do think the Dem Democrats still are holding to that because I don't know what they plan for the 2024 election. And when I talk to um, former intelligence officers who are concerned about the state of America or former military officers who are concerned about the state of America, they feel that after this November election, there could be potential chaos to a greater level. And so I worry when I hear the Democrats still pushing this or Joe Biden, what he says today, and the fact that they're still making arrests, that that is part of the plan. And I think we have to be aware of that. Now, for those people in our lives who still buy the CBS narrative or the NBC, particularly MSNBC, because I do watch it. I watch CNN more than I watch, say, maybe conservative media, because I want to know what they're saying so that I can, you know, adequately do my job. Um, they're still pushing it in a great way, which makes me think that they have some kind of plan. But I think that if I got this asked this question the other day, and I hope I'm saying, you know, putting this in this concise way. I know I'm all over this the place, but that's why I no longer shy away. And I'm in an area, Stephen, where a lot of people don't know who I am. And I am actually in mom circles and doing carpool and very active. And sometimes I'll hear someone say something and I pipe up and I'll say the facts that I know or share. Oh, well, maybe not in an explicit way, so I don't out myself, but um to you know, say, go look at this and go look. And I think that's what we have to do. I think we can no longer just sit back and, you know, read it for ourselves and trust that it's going to get out there. We have to start talking to our neighbors when it comes up. Maybe it's not easy to bring it up, but if it comes up naturally and start talking about the state of our country and what we know, because I think they have a lot planned for us in November. Yeah. Well, we know that they have a lot planned for Trump. Um, I want to switch gears and talk about this Letitia James situation. It came out today that Trump is not able to get the $454 million bond. They're now telling him, you've got to liquidate a billion dollars in real estate holdings. 
Uh, the court does not care that he has these assets. They want them liquid. They want cash payment. Uh, otherwise, $114,000 a day in interest. Uh, what What's your take on this Letitia James situation? To me, this seems like they have come up with a dozen different ways to hurt Trump. And this is the first one that I believe has has really actually hurt where they could end up keeping him out of, um, you know, time out uh, trying to, um, you know, let people know his message. But at the same time, they're trying to financially bankrupt him, hurt his family, hurt his image. What are your thoughts? Well, they're actually talking about seizing his assets, right? Which she she can pro probably do in New York. Um, we've gone to the next le level. Look, Letitia James is a daughter of a Marxist, as so many of these people are. Bonnie Willis and her dad, if you look at the ties, the political ties he has um, in the past, the thing about Donald Trump is that, yeah, they might effectively be able to, some people say, oh, well, they'll not bring him down. And so far, they haven't been successful, but Letitia James could seize his assets right in New York. Um, and we're seeing this against populist leaders around the globe. It's not just Donald Trump. Look at what's happening to Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil or what, like in, what happened to Imran Khan in Pakistan. Um, this is a coordinated effort. It is the leaders of these populist movements. Now we are seeing the actions against the J6 political prisoners, but I'll even get to what's happening with us with Substack. Now, we're being asked to give them access, just certain ones of us, not everybody, but just certain people are being asked to give them access to our bank accounts. They want us to link to it so that they can see all the transactions, the incoming, the outgoing, and they say it's a credit review. And I'm seeing increasingly how financial transactions or, you know, maybe not even lawsuits will be used to control people. So while you look at they're doing it to Donald Trump now to keep him out of the race and to keep him from being a viable candidate, this is just the start, the tip of the iceberg of the kind of financial jihad they will enact against average Americans who they think don't politically align with them. That's one reason this is so problematic. And don't, don't forget, these are true Marxists. And so they will go for it. And I think that that is what is happening with Donald Trump. Now, will they be successful? Letitia James might be the one, and as much fun as we might make of her or how serious she doesn't seem to be, right, because of how she ran on taking down Donald Trump, she actually has a, a pretty strong possibility of doing that probably more so than Fonnie Willis or maybe even Jack Smith right because Jack Smith's case is very problematic and look Letitia James has problems of her own and I don't think it's really come out enough yet and we're going to cover this on the, my show on Frank's speech the absolute truth with Emerald Robinson more in depth soon we're just waiting to be able to release the records but she has this whole ghost voter the smurfing problem with her these people are funded and you have to question where the funds are coming from but it's happening across the nation. Um, she's also, and in talking about, sorry, I know I'm going on long, but even not just talking about going after Donald Trump, she is taking on V there. She's threatening to close them down. And I don't, know, I don't know if you know them. It's Peter Brimlow's organization and they're open. And there's a lot of people, you know, they've been, they've faced controversy for years, but Letitia James is on the, the cusp of taking them down as well. And they're just some 501 you know, uh, C3 organization that's not as well known or not as powerful as Donald Trump, but they consider them a threat because they've been very, um, they've been very critical of immigration policy for a long time. So it's these kind of people now, but it could be you later. Yeah. My, my biggest worry with Letitia James is um, you know, look how far she's already come against yeah. Donald Trump. And she's in a state where I don't believe he could get a fair trial because of how many people in the city of New York have been prejudiced against Donald Trump. But the people that voted her in, they're likely saying, wow, this is the first politician that kept her word and actually, you know, <laughs> did. And that's scary, right? Fair. Because her, her word was, 
I'm going to go get this big, bad white man with too much money. And then she did it. And so they're going to be like, wow, look, she is a great politician because she kept her word. That's That has me a little bit nervous. That's an excellent point. And Fonnie Willis is sort of the same thing too, right? She made no bones about the fact that she would go after Donald Trump and, and, and for a while politically. And within her circles, she has she has strong support within her circles, but on the broader, and they also have strong, again, I'll go back to the ghost donors though. They have strong support from somewhere, dark money essentially that comes through smurfing. And that's extremely concerning. We're in a place where, and again, I had someone call me like two days ago and say, Emerald, you're so depressing. You're so black pilled, you know, but I, Stephen, like to look at the real reality of the situation that we're in, because if we don't look at the reality of the situation, we can't adjust, we can't protect our families, and we certainly can't fix it, right, if we're if we're looking at hopium. And there, I, I've heard people for two or three years say, well, they won't be able to stick any of this to Donald Trump. So far, they haven't. And I've actually been a little bit surprised that they haven't been able to because there's so much coming against him and they're so coordinated. And look, it is being coordinated at the White House level. It's at the top of the chain. And we know that based on the the, the Fonnie Willis um, disqualification hearing, thanks to the divorce proceedings of Nathan Wade, right? It goes back to that, or we might not have known any of this. Um, so it's so coordinated at a top level we really have such deep rot that it's it, it's hard to see how we get out of this. Yeah, um, I, I found it incredibly uh, ironic and hypocritical that you have uh, Joe Biden saying, look how evil Vladimir Putin is. He locks up his political enemy and then lets him die in prison. Meanwhile, we find out behind the scenes that the White House has been putting a spy into the Fonnie Willis camp that they yes. coordinated with Fonnie Willis. They held secret meetings with her lover, Nate Wade. Like th these attacks on Donald Trump are coming directly out of the White House. Uh, Fonnie Willis had a secret meeting with the mayor of Atlanta and Kamala Harris. Like these are, these are marching orders from the top. How can he with a straight face say Vladimir Putin is evil for locking up his his political, per is it because they know that most people won't look into it? That that people on their side of the aisle aren't watching shows like yours and mine? Well, I think it's easy for Joe Biden to say anything with a straight face because, honey, he is Botox and pulled tight within an inch of his life. And he hardly knows what he's saying these days, let's be honest. <laughs> so for him... <laughs> It's easy for him to say anything. And I, I mean, he he is nothing more than a mouthpiece that they have to drug up to get out there. And look, I know this because I spent years in the White House press pool. I talked to the Secret Service and even in the first year of his term, they were having a very difficult time serving under him because, you know, I won't tell you how I know, I guess, but it's very hard for them even though it's their duty to serve and protect for many of them they see the um fraud that's being enacted against the american people and I, I mean he was having major problems even in the first year so imagine now so yeah i i you know but as far as the hypocrisy what i find even i don't it doesn't surprise me from this biden regime right that's what we expected and he's just an extension of the obama's regime look Obama was seen coming out of 21 downing today. What is that? I mean, 10 downing. That's, um, you know, it just tells you that this is really the third Obama term. But what was more upsetting to me and I think is more worrisome is the kind of um, subterfuge that was enacted during the Trump years. You had some people in the Trump administration who was sort of doing what you're seeing even in the Biden administration to counter Donald Trump and the Trump agenda. So that just tells you how it's it's not even really just about Joe Biden. It is this steady state set of military industrial complex, the set foreign policy where they're all getting kept back and everybody's getting rich. Um, and so that's even more the real problem. Sure, the Bidens are extremely corrupt 
And they use them, the steady state, this deep state, the globalists use them because they're willing to take the money and enact the policies. So of course they make sure that he's there and he gets in the White House. Um, but as far as Joe Biden saying it with a straight face, that's pretty easy for him to do in his current you know, lack of mental capacity and lack of ability to really move his facial muscles. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> final final question. I appreciate you coming on. Um, I read today um, an exclusive from the Daily Mail that um, someone has come forward and, and said uh, that behind the scenes, West Wing, the White House, his private apartment, that Biden is just angry all the time. Um, do you think that this has to do with having such low approval rating? Is this the fact that all of the traps he's set for Trump haven't haven't caught him yet? Is this dementia? Is this all of it? What What are your thoughts? I think in watching him, and even if you say turn off the the sound in his videos, I think he is it's related to his cognitive decline. I mean, and sure, anyone any president would be angry with this kind of approval rating or certain. Other, but I think when you look at Joe Biden, and again, paired with the intel that I get from Secret Service agents, this is how many, we're nearly four years into this. He's almost at the end of his term. And I would tell you, in the first year, Stephen, they didn't even think he would make it then because he was already having, again, significant problems. And they would tell me, without going into gory detail, he would get up in the middle of the night without his clothes then. And it was the problem of keeping him in his room. So I think it's more related to his cognitive decline. Sure, he has a lot of stressors. Um, but I think it, I, I I think this is a man in significant cognitive decline. And then I saw last week a video that they put out of him shuffling across the, the, the South Lawn to go into the Marine One. And they had changed his shoes. And I mean, that... It, it's sad in a way. I don't know. I don't think Joe Biden, Biden has been a very upstanding man, but I have a friend. I have had friends whose family members have went into similar cognitive decline and I've been personally observed it. That's what he looks like. And for them, it was very sad, right? It's, it, it's hard to watch. And I see so many similarities in their decline and what I see from Joe Biden. So I would tend to say it's more related to that. Okay. I did think of one more question. I hope that's okay. Sure. Of um, course. So last week, uh, Robert Hur, the special counsel for the stolen top secret documents from Biden, he he defended his report about not putting him on the stand because he's a frail, weak, um, you know, he's lost his mind. Do you think that Robert Hur? was looking for an off ramp, like, oh my gosh, I do not want my name attached to, you know, criminally charging a sitting president of the United States. And he chickened out or I, I just, I can't understand why he's saying I didn't exonerate him. And yet in writing, he exonerates him. And then he says that he's done all these bad things and these illegal things, but then he didn't want to press charges and then uh, Merrick Garland could have held it back, but decided to make it public. Like something is fishy here. To me, this just sounds like they were looking for an off ramp to scold him publicly and then move on without actually putting the guy in jail for crimes. You have very good intuition, Stephen. I will say there, there's a lot you should know about Robert Hur that probably a lot of people don't know about his background. So Robert Hur, before he was the U.S. Attorney for Maryland, actually was one of the he was the top principal staffer for one Rod Rosenstein. Now that sounds like a blast from the past, right? And I think he's just the epitome of swamp creatures. He was the deputy um, attorney general who got tasked with running the DOJ essentially. Remember after Jeff Sessions recused himself from the, the Russia investigation, it was Rod Rosenstein who was overseeing that. Well, Rod Rosenstein was the person who made sure that the Mueller probe happened. He also was the person who suggested that he should wear a wire in a, a private meeting with Donald Trump as, you know, potential entrapment. He also was trying to rally behind the scenes cabinet members to invoke the 25th Amendment, though he's technically a Republican, right? 
Um, he also was someone who planted someone to, he was also running the operation that planted someone to spy on uh, former CBS and investigative journalist Cheryl Ackeson. So Robert Herr was around for a lot of that. Yeah. And so when Robert Herr was testifying before Congress last week, I had multiple former DOJ staffers reach out to me and suggest that, you know, that he did what you said. He was sort of playing it safe. He's a protector of the institution. He's a protector of this overall. He also would be someone who might be in line for a big job in a potential second Trump administration, perhaps even like his, pre his they call him a protege to Rod Rosenstein. His So his mentor, Rod Rosenstein, a deputy AG slot. He is someone who, because he is very swampy, he could be confirmed to a big job. He, at the very least, would want a federal judgeship um, under a Trump administration. So this was him going out and making it seem like he was tough and giving some potential good sound bites. And if you saw the New York Post ran with a very flattering headline for conservative bent for him. Um, but he, at the end of the day, he declined to prosecute. Now, the DOJ might have killed that investigation. Merrick Garland surely would have made sure it didn't go forward. But at the very least, given what he says he found, he should have recommended charges, right? So this is a guy who is not a good actor. No matter what they try to say and what he said about it at the end of the day, he was looking out for himself and possibly the institution. Rod Rosenstein was very problematic in the early Trump years. And, and, and the people that I talked to that worked with her at the DOJ during that time suggested that if he is seen as a hero and he makes it into, if say Trump does get another term and he gets a big job at the DOJ, he would be very problematic again. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's what my gut was telling me was like, he was like, okay, I have to cross every T dot every I, I have to look tough. But my goodness, please give yeah. me an off ramp so that I don't lose my job and I can keep making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. The only other thought that I had was, you know, Merrick Garland says, you know, oof, we're just so darn honest. We had to put this report out, even though it says that Biden is is, is weak and 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 feebly minded. But then, boom, that comes right on the heels of the um, State of the Union where he appears to be hopped up on caffeine and Adderall, giving this very energetic, um, um, you know, angry speech to the American people. I don't know. I just thought the, the the timing of those two was interesting. And it could be killing two birds with one stone or three or four birds with one stone, as we often see in, in politics, right? Because it, it, her could kind of play it both ways. He could say he didn't prosecute Biden, but he was, you know, said this, so he might land another big job in a Republican administration where he continues the, the ongoing policy of the DOJ and he protects the institution in many ways like Bill Barr did, right? Remember when Bill Barr auditioned on TV and in op-eds saying that, oh, Russiagate, Russiagate, and this is so problematic. But what he did at the DOJ was make sure that the institution was fine while not really... Um, Hold, holding those who were guilty of perpetrating the Russiagate hoax accountable. There were no changes. Bruce Orr, I think, is still, who was central to Russiagate, and we probably don't have time to get into who Bruce Orr is, so your audience should go look him up. I think he's still at the DOJ. Bill Barr could have gotten rid of him on day one, okay? Bill Barr absolutely declined looking into election fraud when, his, when some of his high-level officials under him came and pleaded to him to do something. They said, look, we have this evidence and one has not went out there publicly like Jeff Clark. They came to him and they said, you have to do this. He said, it's not going to matter next year. And he said, can I help you find a job to give you, you know, so um, Bruce, Robert Herr is out of that brand, right? But then it also might help Merrick Garland. Look, Merrick Garland, I don't think he's a Biden guy. I don't think he's loyal to Biden. I think he's loyal to the Democrat Party, or you could say even beyond that, the Uniparty, right? Um, and so they might have to get rid of Biden. Look at him. We don't know if he's going to make it to the election. We don't know if they hobble him across the election and he and, and they manage to keep him in place, but he doesn't make it through inauguration. 
and they have to have some kind of off ramp, right? So they're always hedging. They're always putting something out there that gives them the next exit strategy should they need it. What was interesting, what was it? Oh, right before midterms or right after midterms, I can't remember exactly. There was all these stories, remember it's, well, I guess it was after midterms. They thought, you could see that maybe they were thinking they weren't gonna go with Biden. And Biden was sort of late announcing his reelection bid. He didn't open an office for a long time. I mean, he announced his bid, then he didn't really have a formal campaign. Um, it seemed like maybe he won't be running. And so you saw sort of media and look, corporate media takes their cues from the Democrat Party or the Uniparty. Um, so if they're actually reporting on Hunter Biden corruption or Joe Biden corruption, that means they're thinking about getting rid of him. So we saw that right a, a year, a year and a half ago. And so I think they were thinking about dumping him. I know they were because there were some big tech oligarchs some big tech money that was trying to recruit Gavin Newsom, draft him in. And remember when Joe Biden went to Lake Tahoe last August or September, and he stayed at um, one oligarch's house, one te big tech guy's house in Tahoe, Gavin Newsom came and met with him. At that time, I was being told, because yes, I'm actually, most people think of me, of me being well-sourced in Republican party, uh, Re Republican politics. Look, I lived in the swamp for years. My neighbors did everything. You know what I mean? They were all across the spectrum. And what I was hearing is that they were actively trying to get Joe Biden to step down and let Gavin Newsom draft draft in. And at that time, there, there was an uptick in the Hunter Biden scandal reporting in the corporate media all across the board, Washington Post, Politico, MS, even MSNBC, definitely CBS and ABC. So they're always hedging, right? And they're giving themselves an off-ramp everywhere. And I think it serves several purposes, Robert, Robert Hurd's report. Interesting. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on. This has been a, an interesting conversation. Uh, if people want to follow you online, Emerald, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, you can always watch my daily show at 4 p.m. Eastern on frankspeech.com. There's also an app you can download for Roku, Apple TV, your, your device. Um, but if you want to follow more of what we talked about today, which is really in the weeds, right? Um, you can go to emerald.tv, which is my sub stack. And I talk about this kind of in-depth analysis and, and the sausage making all the time. Okay, great. I will put emerald.tv down below. Thank you so much for coming on. Folks, if you guys like these kind of incredible interviews and these high level guests, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Emerald, thank you so much. And I will see you, you. Uh, on the next video. Thank you. Thanks.